day, another dollar or 50 cents as the case may be, if you're John Shannon. Uh, Mr. Shannon, our guest today has a most familiar name to almost anybody. Greg Cosell of NFL Films will join us. Would you care to tell the people who uh, Mr. Cosell, this Mr. Cosell is? Well, let me tell you one thing, Bob. <laughs> Greg Cosell is Howard Cosell's nephew, and he works in NFL Films. Been there a long time, too, I gather, yeah? Yeah, yeah he has. And he's really morphed into, uh, from a production person, into a commentator uh, and a draft an analyst. And uh, that's why we got him today, because we want to talk about the NFL draft and the process they've gone through this year. It's not Howard, but it is Greg Cosell coming up uh, after these messages. Greg Cosell is with us from uh, NFL Films Today. Yours truly, Bob McCowan, along with uh, John Shannon, as we get uh, set for one of the big events of the year, the uh, NFL Draft, which commences tomorrow. I have to say commences because this is a multi-day project. Uh, how many years have you uh, worked with NFL Films now, Greg? Well, this coming season, Bob, will be my 42nd season with NFL Films. Wow. Hold so on, I've been... your name's not Sable? Your name's ah, not Sable? Well, Steve was my mentor, but um, yeah, uh, Peter King, and I'm sure you know who Peter King is. Peter well. King, uh, it was not obviously this past training camp because it was COVID, but it was the year before we were both at Eagles training camp the same day. And uh, we were chatting and he said, do you know you've been with the NFL for 40% of its existence? And that kind of made me stand up and take notice for a second. Well, indeed it should. Um, we are familiar with NFL films. I, well, I say we, most people I think are familiar with NFL films because of your unique approach to principally game footage, behind the scenes stuff, trying to take a perspective that the television networks don't take. How do you implement that with the draft or do you well nfl films at its core we're doc documentary filmmakers the whole premise of the company when ed sable came up with the idea in the early 60s was to in a sense present football in in the way that hollywood presents movies that was the initial premise and obviously we built upon that the draft is a little different because the draft is not a not a game. The draft is an event, so it's that that's a different thing. I mean, we obviously shoot the draft because we have to shoot Roger Goodell announcing the players and the players coming up. We we go behind the scenes. We get a chance to talk to the players. Um, we do a lot of work, documentary type work, leading up to the draft with college players. We get a lot of access. Um, so it's uh, you know that that's kind of what we are but at, at our core we're we're documentary filmmakers I'm, I'm probably a little bit of an outlier at this point in my career i did documentary films for years and years but i've kind of evolved over time into the x and o tactical football guy so that that's that's kind of what i am i, I i'm the little bit of the outlier just like devonta smith is an outlier at 166 pounds i'm an outlier okay so, <laughs> before we talk about the players of the, of the draft um the relationship between films and the NFL network, uh, where, where does that, uh, how much in common do you have with them and how much do you supply to them versus how much you supply to all the other rights holders? Well, we're all part of the NFL, NFL films, NFL network, NFL.com. We're all part of the NFL. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of work for the NFL network. In fact, a lot of the work that airs on the NFL network whether it's shows like America's Game or A Football Life, those those are our shows. They just air on the NFL Network because we have a symbiotic relationship. Um, I we have something in common in uh, vaguely because um, I I don't know that I consider myself a, uh, necessarily a documentary filmmaker, but I have a company that does a documentary film, um, and you start with the premise of what are we going to do, and then acquire the footage or shoot the footage that you you need does it work the same with the national football league because you guys are essentially shooting every day every game right and i'm wondering whether the 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 concept for the show comes first or is it an amalgamation of the footage that you've acquired sometimes the concept comes later you know 
it's funny you're asking me all this because in, in many ways I've been removed in, my, in the last number mm -hmm. of years from this kind of work because I, I do the matchup, the NFL matchup show. So I do that and then I go right into draft because we do two NFL draft matchup specials that we actually just completed. Um, and I work with South Palantonia, who's the host, and Matt Bowen. So a lot of what you're asking me, I'm really not involved in those processes anymore. Okay. So I don't really know. I mean, you know, we have a lot of we've had a lot of Zoom meetings for obvious reasons, which I hear and I hear a lot of the things we're working on and we're doing, but I'm not actively involved in how we go about doing those kinds of things. Now, we've expanded a lot. Amazingly enough, we're doing more work than ever, given that we've just come off a pandemic season. And that's great for the company. But I'm, I'm, I truly am not actively involved in a lot of those kinds of projects. Understood. All right. Is this the Trevor Lawrence draft only? I mean, or is this a deeper draft than Trevor Lawrence? <laughs> so you're assuming that Trevor Lawrence is the best prospect in the draft? Actually, you know what? Uh, you bring up a really good point. He's a quarterback. I think so that, 12, months, yeah. 12, 12 months ago, I probably would have said yes, for sure. Uh, and, and this week, I, I have to do, do it all the screening. <laughs> I'm not so sure anymore. Um, well, I tell you that who I think the best prospect in the draft is, I think the best prospect, regardless of position is, is Kyle Pitts, but, uh, he's not going to be drafted first. Obviously quarterbacks always get taken high. It will be a quarterback draft. The top three picks will be quarterbacks. And then we'll find out what the Atlanta Falcons do it for. Um, to me, Trevor Lawrence is the number one quarterback, although I don't think he's a totally clean player. Um, I don't get caught up in words like generational. They don't mean anything to me. I said in my office here at NFL Films, I grind away watching tape. Uh, I, I've been doing that for years and years. We got the NFL coaching tape in 1992. That's when I really started watching NFL coaching tape. I've probably been watching college coaching tape for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm jaded, but I don't usually get caught up in generational. Although I will say that I think Kyle Pitts is truly special. Tell me what you perceive the difference to be from the tape that you have access to that the average fan does not. Does it give you a true better insight? For sure. Now, I'm not putting myself above anybody else who can watch okay. this tape, but to me, in order to really understand and evaluate the game, you need to see what we call the all 22. Now, mm. can you look at a defensive lineman and just see ISO shots of him? Sure you can. But I think to understand the game and to understand all the game, you need to see the all 22. And uh, I know that there's a lot of people now with the internet, uh, Twitter, social media, the whole deal that, um, you know, evaluate players. It, it started as a cottage industry. Now there's so many who do it uh, that it's it's more than a cottage industry. I just do my job. I don't I don't have any idea what other people are looking at. I can tell you that college coaching tape, the All 22, is very hard to get. That's not just available anywhere. So I work for the NFL, so I have a different access. I I do have access to it. But and maybe I'm jaded at this point in my career. But I really believe that in order to truly evaluate the game and therefore the players within the game, that you need to see the All-22. Uh, perhaps we should take a moment here, John. I know you're familiar with the phrase All-22, and certainly I am. But maybe, Greg, you can take a second and sure. explain to the average fan what the All-22 vision is. The All-22, what you see um, is you see a wide enough angle where you can see All-22 players. Right. So therefore, you can see... Uh, route concepts, you can see coverage, you can see how everything is tied together. So a perfect example is to me, you can't evaluate a quarterback unless you can see that because you don't know what the route concepts are and you don't know what the coverage is unless you can see all 22 players. And then of course, part of the all 22 is also what we call ends, an end zone shot where you see an end, an end zone angle. And obviously that's different than seeing the all 22 players, but the end zone angle gives you a really good feel for offensive line play, defensive line play, pressure schemes, those kinds of things. So to me, and, and like I said, I've been doing this for years. I, I would not feel comfortable at all trying to evaluate players if I could not see the all 22. 
it occurs to me that the probably the easiest thing to assess is a quarterback's performance because one of the things you get with the all 22 as you alluded to is the ability to see the routes that are run by the receivers and whether receivers are open at particular times and quarterbacks are missing them and that would aid you in your evaluation of the skill set of well, that of that particular quarterback but is there one position well that you've encountered where the the all 22 is the most difficult in your assessment of that of that player is it well lineman? let me let me start by what you said with the quarterback you know we live in a world now of metrics and analytics of course but there's still certain things you can't in my view maybe maybe they feel they can i, I don't know the answer i mean I, i've studied analytics i've studied metrics um more information is always better than less information, obviously, in any business. But I think sometimes it's hard when there's 22 moving pieces on every play. You know, to me, it's not like baseball. I don't know if you guys are baseball fans, but I go back to the to the mm. mid 80s when Bob James, I don't know if you remember that name, he started with oh, baseball yeah. with Saber metrics and analytics. And I was a baseball guy growing up because I played it. And, uh, you know, I go back uh, I go back a few years with that and I loved it. I loved all that, but baseball is a static sport. Football is not a static sport. So I'm not saying that the analytics don't mean anything. That would be naive and stupid, but I think yet to me, you have to understand their place. So just coming off what you said, Bob, which I thought was fascinating is, you know, when you watch a quarterback play, what, what I don't believe there's a metric for is throws that should be made that aren't made exactly right and that's you in a sense brought up that point and it's a really really good one and that's what the all 22 allows you to see because i've been doing this long enough that i know i know route concepts there's not a thousand route concepts by the way you know so you people think oh you know it's, it's complicated it's not complicated and I, I never use that word in football football's detailed um, but you see throws based on a route concept where you say you know he should be turning that ball loose based on the route concept versus the coverage and if he doesn't, and you start seeing a pattern, let's say, with that, when you're watching a quarterback, that's an issue. Because in the NFL, mm -hmm. if you're going to tr transition to the NFL and you're not going to turn it loose, then you can't play quarterback. You know, in, in the game of hockey, Greg, we've had a, a major issue this uh, winter trying to scout young hockey players to be drafted in the NHL. COVID right. has really sure. hurt junior hockey, college hockey. Uh, has it been the same for college football? I know, you know, some of the, some some conferences have played, some haven't. How has it affected what NFL scouts have done? Um, that's a great question. I think what they feel is most problematic is not necessarily watching the tape. You can watch the tape. And by the way, you should always start with the tape. That, that's the starting point um, because that – now you're watching a guy play football and so you start with the tape but but i think what they the issue for this year is, is they don't feel they know the players because zoom calls maybe a phone call that's not the same as really getting an opportunity to sit down with players and really talk to them and get to know them also i i'm not certain about what i'm about to say but i think it's true i think they don't feel that the medicals are quite as thorough um and substantive as they normally would be because first of all there was no combine and at the combine you get all the medicals that for some people the medicals are the, are the most important part of the combine um so you don't get those two things that are absolutely critical factors um you know some players are just clean players and they're great guys and they have no major injuries and th but those guys are few and far between um uh, and, although most mm -hmm. most kids are good kids, I, and I've learned through the years doing interviews with NFL players, you know, 98% of them are great guys. But but still, you want to get that feeling personally, John. And I think that's where teams would say that this has been a tough year. They just have not been able to get to know players and get a great feel for the medicals. Is there a question? I mean, you're talking a little bit about you're talking about medicals, but you're talking about character too. That's the issue. Is there a is there a question that coaches have asked, scouts have asked, you have asked of a player that you believe might be the most revealing question? Well, you know, it's funny you ask me that, Bob. I don't get into that, you know, and it, a lot of people ask me about that. You're, you're not the first. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm a tape guy. So a lot of people say to me, you know, well, is he a leader? And, and my answer is it's a pat answer. 
I say, there's no possible way I can answer that because, yeah. you know, you need, you look, you guys know this, you cover hockey, you know, and hockey is obviously a very physical, intense sport. You know, it's played three teams play three, four nights a week. It's, it's brutal. I mean, I, like I said, I was fortunate enough to sit in the front row for some hockey games throughout my life. And it's, it's, it's a brutal sport. Um, and, you know, you can't, you don't know if someone's a leader, you don't know their character unless you're with them every day. Sure. So, you know, that, that's what teams want to get a feel for. Um, that's what's harder this year. I don't personally deal with that. And I, I know it's extremely important, but I have no way of knowing that. So uh, for people who know me, they know that one of the things that I think I'm respected in my field is I don't talk about things I don't know, which of course, as you guys know, a lot of people do, you know, yeah, I don't do that. So, I, I, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, about people's character. Like I've been around Trevor Lawrence, for instance, at a, I was around him twice at, at, at a couple of events and, you know, just my short experience with him, I thought he was a great, great kid, but I can't say that he's a great leader, that he has great character. You know, he seemed like a great kid to me, but that's, that's really all I can say. With Greg uh, Kosell of uh, NFL Films, I, I want to wind back a little bit to a question I asked a couple minutes ago, and we, we kind of got off on a bit of a tangent. And I asked you, you know, of the all 22, is there one position that is oh. hardest to evaluate? Um, yes. Assess that for me, will you? Yeah, I think in college in particular, uh, that, that's what we're kind of speaking about because the draft is, is upcoming here. Um, oftentimes, corner and safety are, are tough to evaluate because mm -hmm. ultimately with a corner, you, you want to see the ball. You want to see the corner have to play corner. So you want to see the ball mm -hmm. thrown. And sometimes you can go through a game and the ball might be thrown to his receiver one time. So you end up trying to get a feel for how he plays, what his movement traits are. Is he sudden? Is he smooth? Can he flip his hips? You know, the terms we use, can he change direction? Can he transition? Um, can he play press man? Does he play press man physically by using his hands and his arms? Does he play what we call mirror match press man, where he lets the receiver declare his route, doesn't touch him, and then just simply tries to get into his hip pocket? He mirrors him. That's called mirror match. Um, safeties can be really hard in college because you could go through a game, and if a player is a back end safety, meaning he plays on the back end, you know, not close to the line of scrimmage, you could go through a whole game and he doesn't do anything. Uh, I can only imagine what it must have been like. I'm, we're all going to date ourselves here, but maybe that's 30, okay. I have yeah, no 30, problem. 40, 30, 40 years ago, when in college football, the run game dominated overwhelmingly, yeah. there were very few um, college teams that, that threw the ball, tw heck, 20 times a game. There were many that didn't throw it 10 times a game. And so to try and evaluate a DB or a corner um, uh, or a safety would it's have been hard. almost impossible, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, is one thing about college football, it's a passing game for sure, and it's a spread game, but there's so many quick throws. There's so many screens. Mm -hmm. There's so many quick hitches. You know, everything in, you know, all these kids grow up playing what we call seven on seven. Are you familiar with that? Sure. You know, with the, all these kids sure. in, in, in the United States, they basically, it, from the time, if you're a quarterback from the time you're nine years old, it's all seven on seven. You know, you're in the shotgun, you get the snap and, and, and I'm simplifying here. This is, this is clearly the cliff notes version. So, you know, but basically you get the ball and you throw it to the first open guy. Yep. And, and that's kind of the way it is. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these um, offenses like the air raid, for instance, you've probably heard that term, the air raid offense, the, uh, the quarterback gets the ball and essentially the defense is irrelevant. You have a route combination and you simply, you know, you have a, you have a progression one, two, three, but you're not concerned about the defense. All you're doing is if one is open, you throw it to him. If he's not open, you just go to two, you know, the defense is not really part of the equation per se. Let me throw one. Actually, other one. I, I want to follow up. I, I, ahead, I, I, Bob, I want to follow some on the on the quarterback thing, because uh, again, I, I think a lot of people who aren't uh, micro managers of football think Trevor Lawrence is at the top of the list, but there are a couple of other quarterbacks in this draft, particularly, yep. that seem to be able to run almost as well as they pass. You know, when you look at Zach Wilson at BYU, uh, and you look at a just, a Justin, maybe Justin Fields, but Trey Lance of North Dakota State. 
Yeah. These are guys, these guys are multiple, multiple uh, versions of guys that can, you know, the, the, I guess what I'm saying is the position seems to be changing as much as we say that it's all throwing, but quarterbacks, quarterbacks do a lot more now than they, than they did say five years ago, don't they? Well, that's a philosophical discussion that we've all been having is oh. <laughs> whether, is, is whether you have to be able to play what we call off script outside of structure to some degree in the NFL. Now there's no definitive answer. It's not a mathematical equation. It's not like saying two and two is four. A lot of coaches will tell you that you don't evaluate a quarterback based on his ability to run around. Um, you don't evaluate a quarterback based on his ability to play outside of structure, because if he can't play effectively within structure, you have nothing. So it's, it's a very delicate balance. Um, Trey Lance, of the names you mentioned, of those top names, is the quarterback that was asked to, to run by design, by play call, more than the others. Um, Zach mm -hmm. Wilson clearly has movement ability, as does Justin Fields. They were not necessarily asked to, to run by design as much as Trey Lance, but they're capable of it. Um, you know, someone like Mac Jones is not that guy. Mac Jones is not an off script outside of structure player. He's a pocket quarterback. Um, so a lot of people have been asking whether, hey, in the NFL now, if Mac Jones can't move, can't react to when the defense wins tactically, which they will, I mean, it's the NFL, then what happens? Is the play over? Does Mac Jones simply have to either take a sack or just throw it away? Whereas Justin Fields, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, they even even uh, Trevor Lawrence, they still have something to do potentially. Um, so it's it's a great question. M Matt Bowen and I have debated it. I've talked to a lot of coaches over the last month or two. Um, it's a fascinating conversation, and there's no there's no real definitive answer. But the bottom line is the game is taught within structure. That coach has spent 16, 17 hours a day, John, doing that. No coach mm -hmm. at practice rolls the ball out and says, let's run around and make a play today. With uh, Greg Cosella of NFL so, Films. But, John, but, will, but, John will tell you this. So, that, so, but, well, you want to jump in, John? No, go ahead. Go. You're an no. Ohio State guy, so I'm waiting for you to bring well, up uh, Ohio State. <laughs> exactly what I was about to say, because the name Justin Fields came I know, up. I know, I know, I know, I know. And... Um, I, I probably wasn't going to raise it, but he would be the maybe fourth, maybe even more likely fifth quarterback ranked in this draft. Maybe. And maybe not. Maybe not. When we, well, of course, we don't know. Right. Um, but I, I will say this um, if you watched Ohio State football games, as I did, um, this guy had periods of time, extended periods of time where his completion rate was otherworldly. Threw the ball more as accurately as any quarterback I think I've I've seen. Right. So what is it about, and we know Fields is mobile and he can run. Whether that's still an asset in the National Football League, I think it is, but I don't, I'm not sure. What is it about Fields that places him below the other three or four guys, in your opinion? What's his shortcoming? Well, I, I don't know if I would place him below, and I'm not sure how teams feel, so I can't answer that. I can't All answer right. it that way. I can tell you what I think of Fields, <laughs> um, but I can't tell you what other people think of Fields or what teams think of Fields, and I guess we'll find out what teams think of Fields uh, when, when the draft comes around. What I mean, do you think, think, though? I think you could easily make an argument that Justin Fields is the second best quarterback prospect in the draft. Um, but we'll see. But, you know, I think what concerns people with fields, and yes, this does show up on tape, is there were times he seemed a little deliberate. There were times that it, it appeared that he had to see it before he released it. Um, and we call that a see it, throw it passer, um, that he did not necessarily have a feel for anticipating throws. Um, and that therefore at times he, what we say is that he left some throws on the field, that he didn't throw the ball when the ball should have been thrown. Um, by the way, Justin Herbert had that problem at Oregon in his senior year. The tape showed that. And then he came into the NFL and did not have that problem. Um, mm -hmm. what I think people always have to remember is 
these are young kids. They're not finished products coming into the NFL. I'm a big believer in coaching. I'm a big believer in how they're taught. I'm a big believer in what scheme they're asked to run. So I think Justin Fields has a lot of really higher level traits that we would say are our high level quarterback traits. Um, did the tape at times show some concerns? Yes, uh, as it did with Justin Herbert. Um, but I think it, I think there's a lot to like about Justin Fields. And I'm again, I don't know how people see him other than myself. Um, but I, I think he's a really, really good prospect. And I think much will depend on where he goes and how he's coached. Here's a stupid question. Is there any historic re relevance to the fact that Ohio State has um, won a whole lot of football games over the last, well, forever, as long as we've been alive? Sure. And have had some highly touted quarterbacks who look great at Ohio State, but have not made it in the National Football League. And you can go all the way back to a guy who I thought had maybe the best arm I've ever seen in Arch Schleister. <laughs> I remember Arch Schleister very well. And who, who did nothing. I hope you didn't bet on him. <laughs> I, I, uh, he did, but yeah. I didn't. Uh, um, um, that historic relevance is coincidental, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm not a big believer in that. You know, uh, I mean, people say that about USC as well. <coughs> um, I think me. you have to evaluate the player. You know, one thing I learned um, from people a lot smarter than I am is when you evaluate a quarterback, You've got to isolate the quarterback's traits, attributes, and characteristics. Now, when you evaluate him and you watch his tape, obviously he plays in the context of an offense. You'd like to see him execute that particular offense at a high level because up to that point, that's what he's been taught, and that's all we have. We have him in college being taught his college offense and executing it. Um, but I, to me, unless you feel in – in interviews, and this is where this year is a tougher year, unless you feel in your research and in interviews and in all those things that teams do that he's not capable of learning at a high level. And by the way, I'm talking generally. I'm not speaking about Justin Fields. So I don't want people to think this is a Justin Fields comment. It's not at all. But if you interview a quarterback and you feel coming away from multiple interviews with him, with others, that, well, I'm not sure he's really going to learn, then you might say, okay, then we don't want them and we might want someone else. But if you feel in doing all your interviews, doing all those things, that there's no issues at all with his ability to, to process information, take it from the iPad and the meeting room to the field and everything is fine, then I don't think the school has anything to do with anything. Uh, we got to take a quick uh, break. We'll one, come back. Uh, oh. I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you have the first question when we come back, John. I promise. Greg Cosell of NFL Films is with us. Back after these messages. Bob McCowan, John Shannon, with you, along with uh, Greg Cosell of NFL Films. Shannon, to you. Yeah. So we, we've we've been harping on quarterbacks, uh, and I'm just curious when you when you look at tape, when you when you look at these guys, how much age plays a factor in where they're drafted. Cause I, uh, you know, some of these guys are you know, just in their early twenties. Some guys are a little older. Like I, I Mac Jones is a little older than a, a couple of these kids. Right. Uh, it, how, how much of that is a factor? I don't think it's a factor unless a guy is, let's say went on a mission, you know, BYU and he's 24, 25. Right. Um, I, I don't think there's a big difference between 20 and 22. The, the only way I'd say that there's a difference is, because I think Trey Lance is really young. Um, but the only difference is, as I said, they're not finished products. So, and I, I think people get caught up in that, John, with these players is, you know, we sit here and obviously at this time of year, um, and, and this is the fun of it, everybody is a draft expert. That's the fun of it. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they evaluate these players and I think they lose sight of the fact that these guys can learn a lot more and they're going to learn a lot more. You know, you, you sit and you watch tape. And I think, to me, the whole point of the tape study is to project and transition. It's not to say, this is what a guy is, and this is all he is. Now, sometimes that might be true, but it's an individual thing. You, that's why you have to watch the tape. You have to study that particular player. But for the most part, the high, high percentage of players 
are not finished products at all. There is much to learn. We just focus on quarterbacks because it's obviously the glamour position and viewed by many as the toughest individual position in team sports. Um, I know a lot of people might say hockey goalie is right up there, and and I can appreciate that, you know, being a hockey fan. But most people would say that playing quarterback is the toughest individual position in team sports. So, you know, these guys are going to be taught an awful lot. You know, just as a quick aside, most offensive coaches will tell you that it takes up to four years for a quarterback to really learn. It doesn't mean he can't play before four years. We know that. But they'll tell you it takes two years to master his offense and then two more years to master everything that goes on defensively in the NFL. So, as I said, somebody tell the New York Jets that. Uh, th- th- therefore, you know, it doesn't mean a guy can't play and you put him out there and he can have success. But, you know, we're talking more in terms of, you know, philosophically. Um, I want to get to something that's a little bit uh, off of where, where we've gone. But uh, we are all, again, old enough to remember the day when it was, I was going to say not unusual, but maybe even rare that a running back was not considered among the top draft picks. Yeah. Um, um, we went through a whole era where, where that was the, uh, almost the priority. And, and you could almost argue over, even over quarterbacks, as illogical as that sounds. We are well past that. It has been a long time since a running back has even been considered as the, the best prospect. Uh, I think, you know, and I mean, mock drafts are... Well, even if they're considered, Bob, the best prospect, people still say that you shouldn't draft them. I mean, Saquon Barkley was the second pick in the draft. And to this day, people think the Giants made a terrible mistake, even though Saquon Barkley was probably number one or number two as a player on everybody's boards. There you go. Yeah. Um, And I looked at, uh, I've looked at, I don't know how many um, projected draft analyses um, over the past couple of days. And I don't know whether you look at them as well. And, and they're, they're as common as cornflakes. Rarely. Know, everybody's got one. I'm not, a, I'm not a list guy, Bob, and I'm not a mock draft guy. No, and I just <laughs> try and get some kind of sense yeah. for fun. Um, yeah. Not because I'm, I'm, I'm into it that much. But on average, one running back is listed as a number one pick. Right. Um, is, there, is there a flaw in this? we think a lot of cycles in, in, in sports, things that were popular 10 years ago are no longer popular today. Yep. Priorities change all the time. Where are we on running backs in the national football league? Well, another great philosophical discussion. The sense is that for the most part that you can get running backs anywhere. And then people use examples like James Robinson was a free agent and rushed for a thousand yards with, with the Jaguars. So people say, look, Therefore, you can pretty much line up anybody at running back. And if you're committed to the running game and he's got some kind of talent, he can be a productive player for you. Um, It's a great question. You know, you look at a team like the Tennessee Titans. They have Derrick Henry. You know, they're clearly a run first offense built on Derrick Henry. Can anybody do what Derrick Henry can do in that offense? Yeah, that's the question, I guess. You know, well. Can, could anybody have done what Marshawn Lynch did for the, the Seahawks in those three or four years? Um, you know, it's, it's a great question. Now what happens is, is most people think in terms of running backs as having to be factors in the passing game. So if you look at Najee Harris from Alabama, who could break the mold, he's a great receiver, but you don't normally think of 6'2", 230-pound backs as third down receiving backs. You have Travis Etienne of Clemson, who is a good receiving back. He can split out in the formation. You have someone named Kenneth Gainwell from Memphis who sat out this year due to COVID, but he's the best receiving back in this draft. I don't know where he'll be drafted, um, but I think people think in terms now that it's a passing league and that if your back can't help you in the running game, then, excuse me, in the passing game, then you can find a back to run the ball 15 times a game. If you have a pretty good all line, you can find that back, you know, in the third, fourth round. I think it all depends on your approach. Um, I know for years to just to play along this, but change the position for years, people said safety wasn't important. You know, you talk about cycles and I remember talking to coaches and they would say, well, you know, if I don't have a safety that can do X, Y, and Z, 
then that limits what I can do with my defensive game plan. So coaches see this differently than, you know, than people on Twitter or people on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have a good player, they feel like, hey, I'm not sure we can do what we really want to do. So coaches see it differently than philosophical discussions. But you're right about running backs. They're kind of seen now as somewhat interchangeable. Well, and John will attest to this, and you brought up goaltenders in hockey because you're a hockey fan. You understand the intricacies of the game. Goaltenders are exactly the same as running backs. Goaltenders right. are not drafted high by the National Hockey League. And yet we, we all... It's fascinating to me because isn't important. that what everybody talks about when you get to the playoffs? It's the great puzzlement of my life. Yeah. I don't... I, I mean, I, you get I've to the never play, understood I mean, the, that. It's funny. The Flyers, a great example, just because I'm here, the Flyers for years were... And they, you know, I haven't really followed hockey this year for the first time in a while. But for years, the Flyers were a solid team and they just didn't have goaltending. And they get to the playoffs and they just didn't have a goaltender. By the way, Greg, nothing's changed this year. So you're... you're you could say it... You could Is that still true for it. the Flyers this year as well? Absolutely. Carter Hart has been disappointing. Uh, early in our discussion, you said that the tight end uh, Pitts was the number one guy in in your opinion. Why was why is he at the top of your list? Oh, well, he's like I said, I've been doing this a long time, so maybe I'm jaded, but he, this kid's a freak. I mean, they put up after his pro day, they put up his pro day numbers, about six or seven of them, on Twitter, and they put Mike Evans' pro day numbers next to Pitts. Mike Evans, the wide receiver for the Tampa Bay Bucks. And mm -hmm. every one of Pitt's measurables was better than Mike Evans. And Pitts is 6'6", 246 pounds. I mean, I watched him last summer because I was home. You know, a lot of us were home with COVID. I watched him last summer. And at that point, you know, people had him as the fifth best tight end. And maybe he was a top 50 or top 60 prospect. And I watched him, in, you know, in my house last summer. I'm thinking to myself, this kid's going to be a top 10 pick. I mean, this kid is is dynamic. He's explosive. He fits the NFL game. He can line up anywhere. He's a receiver. He's it doesn't matter what two letters you put before or after his name. He's a receiving weapon who can line up anywhere. And see what you're trying to do offensively with your use of personnel and formations is you're trying to make the game easier, relatively speaking, for your quarterback. You want to give your quarterback as much information before the snap of the ball as you can possibly give him. And that's what personnel and formations help you do. And Pitts is that kind of guy because he can line up anywhere. And, and therefore, you'll learn. Well, you'll know based on tape study leading up to the game, but you'll learn through the first series or two exactly what the defense will do. And it gives your quarterback a ton of information. Would you draft? It's hard to imagine. Sorry, Sorry, Bobby. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine a draft where you're talking about a guy of Pitts's size and a guy of Devontae Smith's size. Yes. But almost 80 pounds difference. Yes. And there's a lot of people that love where Devontae Smith's going to play too, right? Well, Devontae Smith is really talented. All I can say about his weight, which is 166, number one, it makes him an outlier and an exception. And number two, it will be discussed in draft meetings. That doesn't mean you won't draft him. That doesn't mean he won't be a really good NFL player. Um, although I think he needs to be used in specific ways. But the point is, is it will be discussed. You know, I'm on Twitter for obvious reasons. In, in, in my business, I need to be on social media. Um, and people just dismiss the 166, you know, oh, if you talk about his weight, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's going to be discussed in draft meetings. Now, you may come out of the draft meeting and say it doesn't matter and we love the kid because the kid, from what I gather from talking to people, is a great kid, works incredibly hard, basically has a professional attitude right now, has great traits as a receiver, no question. None of that's an issue, but he's an outlier. There's not a lot of 166-pound great receivers. So it will be discussed. Then you have to decide what that means to you. But to act like it's you're an idiot if you if you mention his weight that's wrong well let me give you again let's do the hockey analogy uh one of the greatest hockey players arguably the greatest hockey player of all time wayne gretzky what did he weigh john well, when he started about 175 maybe less i thought it was less than that but okay what he, yeah he guys like that though i mean you know it's funny you mentioned that bob because you know it's like when people want to uh, um 
compare quarterbacks to, let's say, Joe Montana or Tom Brady. And, you know, you always have to be careful with that. I mean, sometimes you can do that stylistically, like he like he, he plays that way. Um, you know, it, but I remember, and again, I, I remember watching Gretz, Gretzky. I remember those Edmonton teams because wasn't Messier on those Edmonton teams yes, he as was. well? And got into the other. Yeah, yeah. They, they had a couple Messier, of other. Coffee, Curry. Coffee. Yeah, I remember coffee. Um, but, you know, Gretzky was just one of those guys, in some ways, like Larry Bird in basketball. He just could see sure. things that other people couldn't see. And that's that's a trait. I mean, you know, this gets off on a tangent, but I really always have struggled in sports with the word intangible. Because I think, now there's no question that, you know, Gretz, a guy like Gretzky just sees things, okay? So you know, obviously not everybody could see it like Gretzky could see it. But when people talk about, let's say, work ethic as an intangible, to me, work ethic's not an intangible. It's a tangible studying is a tangible you know you have to be studying the right things and working at the right things and you have to be taught how to do that but working hard to me is not an intangible that's a no. tangible and greg I, I bring it up simply from the perspective of um 166 pound wide receiver yeah. one of the questions is going to be durability without and, question great and, point and wayne gretzky played in an era where the national hockey league was as violent as hard hitting as it's ever been, as any sport has and ever been. And who is been. the enforcer on Edmonton then? Uh, well, McSorley, I guess. Dave Semenko. Oh, Semenko. Yeah. Dave right. Semenko. But I remember Marty McSorley, yeah. But but um, nonetheless, Gretzky took the hits, if you could hit him. Right, um, right. He took them. And, and so the philosophy of size, while important in almost all cases, sometimes there is an outlier every Without once in a while. Oh, and maybe no. this kid is that guy. He might be. I, I wasn't. I, believe me, I love the kids' traits. I wasn't saying. He oh, can't I know you play. do. I just think it's you have to have that discussion in you know in uh, in, in your meetings. It it has to be a discussion, and that's why I said I think he has to be used in certain ways. If I could just speak tactically for a quick moment, you know, in football, there's and there's a lot of formations now, but in football, it essentially starts with two two receiving categories, what they call an X and a Z. The X receiver lines up on the ball right on the line of scrimmage yep. so if you want to press him the corner's closer to him okay the z receiver is the receiver that's off the ball and he can go in motion okay mm -hmm. to me Devonta smith has to be a z you don't want him right on the ball not that he's incapable i've seen him defeat press but i've also seen him pushed out of bounds to me, you don't want him right on the ball where a 210-pound corner or a 215-pound corner, like a Patrick Peterson, for instance, can just put his hands right on him and yep. shove him. You want him – he's hes a linear strider. He, he, you want him to get – to stride out. That's the kind of receiver he is. So you want him off the ball or you want him in motion. Motion receivers tend not to be pressed in the NFL. So you want to give him what we call free access – off the line of scrimmage he can stride out and then then do what he what he does and he's really good at what he does uh i hate to who do goes this first Jay, who, who, go, I, what, who goes be does does jason does, does jason waddle go before devontae smith jamar uh jalen waddle jalen waddle sorry okay, well jamar jamar chase to me is the best wide receiving prospect in this draft so he'll go before devontae smith i believe again you never know what teams think and Jalen Waddle is is fascinating to me because he's very much to me like Tyreek Hill. So I love mm -hmm. Jalen Waddle. He's he's I've I can't recall. I don't want to say I've never seen because I've seen a lot, but I can't recall seeing a player who can move at such a high rate of speed and velocity, and yet be so controlled and efficient in his movements. That's Jalen Waddle to me. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation and we could chat forever and ever, but time is our enemy on this uh, program. We want to, uh, take, well, we'll do it again time. sometime. Maybe, you know, love to, summer. Uh, absolutely. You have an open invitation, Greg. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, good luck uh, with uh, all you're doing over the next few days. And, um, hopefully we'll have a chance to chat again real soon. I appreciate it guys. Thanks for having me. Greg Cosell of NFL films. We'll come back and wrap it up after these messages. Bob McCown, John Shannon uh, with you. Uh, before we wrap it up, put it in a brown paper bag, leave it on somebody's doorstep. Um, that was fun. Um, learned a lot. And um, he's, he's a guy who's passionate about what he does, isn't he?
He, he is. I mean, there's almost a, a degree of what I would describe uh, integrity and honor in it because he won't go down the rabbit holes of mock drafts or or uh, full predictions because he because he, he, I mean the human aspect of drafting any player uh, and and what manager what what coaches want for their teams changes on draft day and changes over the summer in their in their first practices so it, it was fascinating he, I think he does think that Trevor Lawrence is first but I don't think we know anything after that <laughs> Well, I think he thinks Trevor Lawrence is first, but I'm not sure he he is absolutely convinced that Trevor Lawrence is the best um, number one choice here. Um, not the best player. He's not the best player for sure. He thinks Pitts, the tight end, is the best player. Well, but, and that, uh, but he thinks Lawrence is the best quarterback with flaws. With flaws, Bob. And as I, I mentioned, for those that are casual NFL fans and probably don't watch or pay any attention to the draft, the, pro, the projection is that the first three selections will all be quarterbacks and Pitts won't be selected until number four. And part of that is situational. I get it. But it's also a reflection of just how important the NFL perceives, and I guess it, the quarterbacks are. And so uh, one, two, three quarterbacks. And you'll probably see five, six, maybe even more taken in the first round. Uh, we will find yeah, that all absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah, we will find that all out starting tomorrow. And really, we'll find it out tomorrow because after the first round, interest wanes. Uh, that'll do it for us. We're back tomorrow with another program, we hope. Hope you'll uh, rejoin us. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, everybody.